It takes me hours to go through this. Oh, you have it in the oven right now? Yeah. It takes like four or five hours to cook. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see you all. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Easter. Yes, Happy Easter. That's right. Um, it's good to be gathered together on this day to remember uh, and celebrate. Um, it's such a great, like Holy Week is such a great week, but it's it's full of emotions, right? It's uh, it's kind of an up and down roller coaster, and here we reach the end, and now we get to celebrate. The resurrection of our living Savior Jesus Christ, and so as we do that this morning, um, I want to start with our uh, reading for this morning. So, if you would stand with me, and we're going to read from Matthew twenty-eight, Matthew twenty-eight, starting in verse one. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow, and the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you and praise you and lift you up today, God, as you are risen. You are risen indeed. And uh, we are so grateful for this. God, we are, we are grateful for what you have done for us. We're grateful that you have risen from the grave as the first fruits of the resurrection. We know that when we believe in you, when we tie our lives to your life, God, that we, that we too will be resurrected as well. And so um, we are thankful this morning for the fact that we have that hope each and every day, no matter what we're facing, no matter what. It's going on in our lives, no matter what we've seen um, around us, that we have the hope of the resurrection because you have been resurrected. And we, th we are thankful that you sit, Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, that you sit and you, you take up our cause. You intercede for us, for him, uh, with him, and, and that um, you represent us. And our hope then is that we can represent you here and now. And so we thank you for this morning that we get to to stand up, to sing, to celebrate, and to praise you for what you have done, the work that you have done, all that you have endured, and all that you have accomplished, and the victory that you've won. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen to
He is risen. He is risen indeed. I I was talking, well, I was talking to Gavin earlier, but then also talking to some other people this week and reflecting on just how good it is as a believer of Jesus Christ, as a follower of the way, as a believer in Scripture, to remember, to celebrate, and to arrive at Easter every year. You know, kids and many of us enjoy, you know, Christmas, and we think it's it, it, when we think it's special, and it is special, and it means so much. But even reflecting on it this morning, Christmas and all the glory of Jesus, God Emmanuel coming down to meet us, actually only is great if we have Easter, if we have Resurrection Sunday. Because if not, for all the miracle and the power and the glory of what happened to the shepherds on that hillside and when the angels proclaimed, if that story had ended with a man dying on the cross and being buried and that was it, then even that and everything amazing that happened from that would not have the significance and the life-altering power of what God did through Jesus Christ, which is the resurrection, the victory over sin and death. When we say and we proclaim, He is risen, it is a, it is a phrase that carries with it all of our hopes and dreams and all the joy and satisfaction of what is, what has been, and what is to come. Because we declare that our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came and was everything He was said to be, He was supposed to be, accomplished all He said He would, and sealed it and made it true by the Spirit resurrecting Him and Him coming back and saying, it is truly finished. It is done. I have accomplished it. We've been talking throughout Lent about the idea of making room for Jesus in a more significant, more intentional way through practices, through beliefs, through ideas, through things that we can incorporate into our life. And it all builds up to the idea of like, what more do we want to make room for in our life than Jesus? Even the practices we've talked about, even the ideas we've talked about, at the end of the day, are just functions, are just things. If it's not about making room for Jesus, the person, the Savior in our life. That is what we celebrate. That is what we remember. That is what we, we cling to. In Luke 24, verses 2 through 8, we read, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And they, they remembered his words. That is the beauty of the God that we serve. It is a God that follows through with what he says. He told them, this is what's going to happen. And if you think back to the Gospels and their responses, no, Jesus, not you. Or how could that be? Or that doesn't make sense. When he died on the cross and he was buried, we find the disciples then huddled together in hiding, mourning, because they didn't get it. They had heard, but they didn't get it. And now here the angels are proclaiming, he did exactly what he said. And as they start remembering the words, you know the story, they start to hope and to dream. Could it be true? Is it true? As they start encountering him, as they start seeing him, they start realizing it actually happened. And their faith, their life, is, their hope is restored and renewed in a mighty way. That is what making room for Jesus, for his word and his truth does for us. It reawakens hope and strength. The, resurre the resurrection of Jesus is, in essence, for all those of us that believe, it is our source of power, our encouragement, and our hope for the everyday life. See, it's not just for Easter morning. That's well enough. If we made it through an entire year and made it to Easter, like think of like a long marathon every year, we made it to Easter, like the finish line being that exhausted, emotionally, spiritually, beaten and worn out but we made it to easter and on easter we heard the truth of the gospel and that god our savior is risen and that lifted us up as it should 
That in itself would be good, but it is a hope and a promise and a power and an encouragement that is meant to do that for us every moment of every day. Because think about it. Our lives are not isolated into needing one good pick-me-up. Every day, this week, news of war in Ukraine, another senseless shooting of a black man by police in our city, a city in mourning and hurting, again. Divorce rates, ongoing illnesses for loved ones, for friends, for ourselves. Dealing with issues of illness and pain, depression, financial struggles, fear, doubt, isolation, loneliness. This is everyday stuff. This is moment by moment stuff. If the message of the resurrection of Jesus was only shared and meant to be like a one time a year pick me up, as powerful as it is, we would find that, well, that's, there's 300 other 60 some other days. What do I do on those days? But it is that truth, the fact that Jesus is risen, the fact that the tomb is empty, the fact that sin and death have been defeated. It is a power and an encouragement that is meant to fuel our everyday life, not just a moment of our life. The resurrection is in many ways not like a finish line. It's not like a single static point. It is the beginning. It is an invitation to something new every day. Because when you're dealing with depression, when you're dealing with addiction, when you're heading towards or getting past a divorce, when you're stretching and trying to navigate how to forgive or how to live in pain or resentment or hurt, when you have rare, very real fears that don't just shut off when you go to bed and don't just go away during the day, they're with you constantly, when your bank account looks the same day after day and it's not enough, when you don't like your job, when your loved ones are in pain or struggling and you can't help them, when the news of war and rumors of war, of storms, of tornadoes, of disasters plague our news. When there's calls for justice on the streets of our city. We need resurrection hope and power to deal with that. We need something to tell us in those moments that even though this is unjust, God is still with us. We need something to tell us that even though I'm in depression or this is hard, God is with me. We need to know that even though I don't know how to get through this financial struggle or we don't seem to be getting ahead on this health issue or I don't know what's going to happen next year with my kids in school or I don't know what's going to happen next year in our city with all these issues and I don't know what, and all the I don't knows and all the pain and all the doubt, we need a real, powerful, true, everyday truth to speak into it and that is that Jesus, our Lord and Savior who loves us and has made a way for us is there with us every day, never leaving us, never forsaking us, never abandoning us. And we can trust it because he said, I will be turned over, I will be crucified, and I will be buried, but in three days I will rise. And he did so. And if he can do that, he can help us navigate depression, financial struggles. He can help us navigate our health issues and our crisis. He can help us walk through injustice and war and pain and suffering. We may not know how he'll get us through. We may not know how he will do it, when he will do it. But because he said, in three days I will rise, and then he did, we have a hope. If he can do that, he can certainly handle this. It is a hope and a power and a joy that is meant to sustain. Because again, what, what did he do? With, what was the cross for? What was he doing? Well, it was multifaceted. One of the main reasons that we, never, we, need not, we cannot forget this is that he came to repair something that was broken. He came to pay for a debt that was owed. Jesus came that we may be freed from the curse and consequences of sin. A debt, a, a sentence, a death sentence that none of us could ever, on our own, by our own efforts, be freed and rid from. God in his love and his mercy and in his sovereignty saw that, the need for repair, and his plan was to send his only begotten son. That's what we read in scripture. We have to remember, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, everyone, everywhere, no exceptions. 
but into that reality, that very familiar verse in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, we live in a world that is affected by sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that sin, as we've talked about many times, creates a separation between us and God, between a good relationship, between us and be able to enjoy eternal life, enjoy God's blessings, and most and foremost, be saved from the punishment, the eternal real punishment that comes from those that do not accept God. Those that do not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior stand condemned. The debt is still theirs and they will never be able to pay it. But for those that recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior, that recognize that he is true, the Son of God who died and was raised again, that he is risen, their debt has been covered by Jesus and they are free, like we just sang about. They're free. We live in a world that is affected by sin. And think of it, I just heard about it this way, and it's, it's not something new, but I like how the person said it. We're, we live in a world that is saturated by sin in three spheres. All of us have the sins that we commit, and how that affect, how they affect us, and what we have to bear with the sin that we commit. We have sins that are committed against us. So even if you're trying your best to not sin, even though we all do, you're still going to be affected by the sins and choices of those around you that are done to you specifically. And then the third layer, there's just sin in the world. Choices that people, governments, systems, others make that even if they're not made specifically against you, you feel the ramifications of. We are in a world that is saturated by sin. And the only solution, solution to that was Jesus. A perfect that could say, you guys can't do it. You guys can't pay for it. You guys can't cover it. But I can, so let me be. He has made a way for us to not be under that burden. That's, that's what he can. That's why, because God so loved us, that's why he sent Jesus. So that whoever, anybody, anywhere, anytime, says, Lord, forgive me, and calls out, they will be saved. That is the gospel in a nutshell. That is the hope that we have, that even in our, in our worst moments, in our darkest hours, through our most difficult storms, there is hope because Jesus says, I am here, I am risen. But it's not just about getting us across the finish line. It's not just about salvation. It's not, see, we often treat it that way, don't we? Give your life to Jesus. Confess your sins. Be saved. Be saved from hell. Be saved from, from consequences and enjoy eternal life. Have the hope and the promise of a future secured with Jesus. All of which is true. But when we only focus on that, we're basically inviting people to kind of like punch their ticket and then you're good. Nothing else. Nothing more. You secured your spot on one of the life rafts of the Titanic. You know, you're good. Is that really? Did Jesus endure all that he do just to get us across some, meta, some metaphysical, spiritual kind of like finish line? And then just, just, okay, you're good. I'll see you when your lifespan's over. <laughs> that was it. No, he came that just that we may be saved, but that we, so that we can experience a new way of life. A life that is full bringing to the top of his love, his guidance, his blessing, every day, every moment. In John 10, 10, he makes it clear, the thief, the enemy, comes, his existence is here, only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his only purpose for you. The devil has no other purpose for you and for your life other than that. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the fullest. That doesn't sound that Christianity is about accept Jesus as Savior, cruise for whatever the remainder of your life is, and then I'll see you at the end. It sounds like he came to do something for us for the eternal, eternal future, but he came to do something for us now, that there should be a change in the way that we live, that we see the world around us, that we engage those around us, and that we engage a relationship with him now, that there is a fullness that without Christ,
Christ, we are missing and that he has come to make available to us. 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this idea of fullness that we have access to through Jesus, of newness, of something different, something unexpected, something that we did not have or that we were not before, points to the fact that past the tomb being empty, past the he is risen, there was more to experience. See, the resurrection is not necessarily a place or a point. I, I've heard it described and I've been reading well, that it can be considered the resurrection, that the acceptance of Christ as a resurrected Lord is more of a door. It's not the end. We don't cross from unsafe to safe and go, ah, oh, and we're done. That was good. I'm glad I crossed over. But what it is is actually an invitation into something new. It's the beginning. It's the start of something new. An imperfect analogy that I heard was this. Think of a horror movie or like a scary movie and the, the characters like outside in the dark and in the storm and the, the monsters or the things or the, the, the whatever is outside and, you know, there's a door and you're knocking on the door, you know, and some, finally somebody kind of like opens it and you go in and there's a moment of like, <sighs> the scariness is outside, but I'm inside now, so I'm good. If the movie ended with a character then just sitting there until they passed away, but they were safe inside, that would be the worst story. And you would, we would all acknowledge, we're they're safe. But what now? No, we want resolution. We want what happens next. You're safe. So what happens now? What, where, where does life go from here? What is the plan? What is the strategy? What does this safety give you? What does escaping the clutches of evil give you? What does coming out of that torment, surviving that storm, what does that provide you? And what, what happens next? In the same way, for those of us that have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have been pardoned of a death sentence. We have been spared damnation and the, and the curse of death, separation from our Savior. We have been promised eternal life. So we have that left to our forward to. Great. But we've also been told, and now that you're here, think of the language that is used for Christians, for those who follow Christ. Now that you are my brothers, my sisters, now that you are children of the Heavenly Father of God, now this is the life that I have for you. Let's start exploring it. I think that's the biggest struggle for me and for others. I've been a Christian for a long time. Maybe not as long as some of you. But I've grown up in the church and around my Bible and around everything from, you know, super book and salty when I was a kid. And I'm, and I'm dating myself there. I am aging myself, all right? But all the way from then... <laughs> to now where there's online churches and podcasts and book and books and seminaries and schools everywhere. And I've been a part of all of it, on and off. I've, I've, gotten the, I've been blessed to be able to be at worship conferences, pastor conferences, um, uh, music festivals, mission trips, seminary, different stages of ministry, vocational ministry for around, I don't know, like almost 20 years now. I've, I've been in it, and if you would think, man, if you've been in it that long, every day just full of life and energy because you get to see it, no. Even this, our sin can make mundane and everyday. Even this, our everyday struggles can dampen and make us question or lose sight of just how significant it is. I look at my life and my struggles and I have them. And I consider my emotional state, my physical state, I consider my day-to-day, -day, my navigating those difficulties, my considering the things in the hats that I have to wear, husband, father, pastor, son, friend, neighbor, community member, son of God. I consider all of these things as one of his children, as one of the kingdom bound, I think, am I living every day like I serve a God who said, in three days I will rise, and he did it? 
who's made a way for me to be in relationship with the one true God. Am I living in a way? That doesn't mean faking it. Oh, life is good. Life is perfect. There's no pain. There's no struggle. But am I living in a way that says, whatever my struggle, whatever the valley of shadow of death that I'm walking through, I have the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one true God, Lord and Savior, Messiah, Adonai, on my side, who defeated sin and death. And if he can do that, he can help me through this. He can sustain. Am I living in a way that shows the world around me, the enemy against me, and my Father above me, that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, conqueror of death, and that he has made a way for me, and that he has invited me into a life of fullness in him, and a new way of life, that my old has passed away. This isn't about guilt or shame or or con you know, maybe conviction, but this is about encouraging us that today, like every year, we are celebrating today the fact that we serve a risen Savior who has made a way for all of us. Amen. And if you haven't made a decision to call Him Lord, to repent, and to accept Him as Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, no better time than today, talk to us. There's no magic formula. We'll talk, we'll pray, we'll, we'll walk through that with you. But if you have, like many of us have, and the message for today is very simple. <clears throat> Be encouraged. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, wherever in your life there are corners or things that bring doubt, that bring pain, that bring struggle, that depress, that make sad, that make angry, wherever you feel like you're running short, that you're not enough, whatever in your life brings uncertainty and anxiety, whatever those places are, without naively or kind of like blindly or, or fakely kind of saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Truly and genuinely, look at those things, look at those circumstances, look at those people, look at those events or, or questions and speak truth into them. I follow the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. I am a new creation under his banner, washed by his blood. I am the adopted children of God the Father. My brother, Jesus Christ, advocates for me and makes a way for me. And these things, these circumstances, these fears, these doubts, these uncertainties, these frustrations will not have Victory over me because I am in I serve in and enjoy the victory of Jesus Christ over all of these things, and I can trust him to see me through. Every day, Jesus has made a way for us to be able to pursue him, know him, love him. And for him to see us through our difficulties. We still live in a world of sin and we anticipate his return. And the culmination of things. But he has made it so that we don't have to look at every day in the midst of our struggles and go, well, I've got eternal life and I'm saved from, from the consequence of sin. So I'll just hold on to that and make it to the end. Don't lose that. But he's made it so that on top of that, or besides just that, he's given you the ability to enjoy victory today, to enjoy peace today, to enjoy confidence in his truth and his word today, to provide guidance, to provide strength, to provide what we need today. His mercies are new every day. Not every week, not every so often, not you're gathering your mercy points and you'll get them all at the end of the road. <laughs> Their mercies are new every day. Manna drops Every day, blessings come. Every day, his presence is available. Every day, his word is there. Every day, his truth is true. Every day. Doesn't matter what your boss says, what your schedule says, what your bank account says, or even doesn't even matter what your body is saying. Not because those things aren't significant, but they don't speak over and above the truth of who Jesus Christ is, what he's done, and what he's offering us. Every day. Day. In John 14, verse 6, we read Jesus talking to the crowds. I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. The reality is that for most of us, and this is how I heard it read, or saw it read, you know, this week, following Jesus for any amount of time will probably involve many doors. What I mean by that is that in following Jesus, there will be many transitions. We're not stagnant. Our life is not stagnant. And neither is our faith in Him. So in our spiritual maturity, in our life, in our journey, in our relationships, as we learn about God, learn about His kingdom, learn about His heart, and we strive to be made in His image, we will be invited to step from door to door, from this to that, to move through the journey that God has for us. And He eagerly wants to lead us because, again, He came so that we may have life and have it in its fullness. There's always more. He has made us new creation. But new doesn't mean, again, one thing. We were this, and now we're that, and now we're done. New is progressive. New, and then there's a new new. Or the next new. Or the evolving new. Because we are a work in progress in his hands. There will be many doors in the question. As we consider, our Lord went through all that he did, and he is risen. He is risen and victorious. That never changes. He stands in victory. And for those of us that follow him, we stand by him, enjoying the fruits and the benefits of his victory every day. His mercies new every day. And if that's the case, and as we pursue him into the fullness of life, because again, if we look at our life, no matter how good it is, would you say your life is full with all that God has for you? Would you say that however full you might think it is, there might be more that you would want from God? Or dare I say, more that he would want for you? So in pursuit of that, then the question becomes, living this life of resurrection, what are the things that may be the doors that God, Jesus is inviting you or calling you to step out of something. So maybe you're in a room where you really shouldn't be, or you've spent too long in that room, or there's things in that room that are not good for you, metaphorically speaking. What is Jesus calling you? Hey, I've risen. I've conquered sin of death. I've made a way. You don't have to stay in that room anymore. Come out of it. What is he calling you out of? Is it a habit? Is it a practice? Is it a way of thinking? What is he calling you out of so that you can experience a new life and a fullness like you haven't before? What is he calling you into? Maybe it's not about you needing to get out of something. Maybe it's something that's like, you're, you're settled. You're too comfortable. There's more to this. I'm glad you're happy. I'm glad you feel blessed. I'm glad you're hashtagging it and that all things are good. But, but, but there's more. I know. I know. It's hard to believe. But there's more. Don't, don't settle. Don't get comfortable. Continue to pursue me. Jesus didn't just die. He didn't go through what he did, endure what he did, and then was brought back to life so that we could have a portion, a little bit, some of it. He came that we may have life to the fullest and to make us new. I want to invite you. I'm going to read a passage from Revelation because, again, the future hope does kind of sustain and help us move forward, but the future hope has to play a role in our immediate hope. What we hope for today, tomorrow, next week, next month matters in the now, but it's also informed by the fact of what he's done for the long run. I want you to consider, to by your hand and as you pray, thanking God for his resurrection and what that means for your past, what it means for now, what it means for your future. But then I also want you to consider, what is he calling you to now? What is something that has plagued you or held you back long enough that he wants to call you out of? And what is something that is through his power of resurrection, the same power that, again, Scripture says it, the same power that raised him from the dead resides in us now. So if we have that reservoir of power, what is he trying to call you out of? And what is he trying to call you into? And could this be the start of that journey, that new chapter, that new room that we walk, that new door we walk through into that new stage of the journey? Because we have a hope. 
So our God keeps his promises and he's displayed his power in that he said, I will be turned over, I will be crucified, I will die and be buried, but on the third day I will rise again and you will see me. You will see me. In Revelation 21, talking about the new heaven and new earth and about the future, the author says, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning, no crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. He said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the fact that that is the promise that we have. That is what you have done and what you say that you will do. So Lord, we celebrate today. We do. You have risen. You have risen indeed. We are free. We are made free and we have hope and victory in you. Free from the shackles and the burden and the consequences of sin. We are no longer bound by We are new creations made new. Raised to life in the resurrection in our baptism with you. But this is not a power and a blessing that is stored in secret for some future day. Although there is future glory, this is a, a truth that is meant to change and, and, and inspire and give us hope and strength and power for today and for every day. To bring hope into our dark world now. So Lord, we pray that you continue to work in us and through us. That we may see the power and the joy and the hope of the resurrection in all that we see and do around us every day. That our relationships will reflect resurrection power. That our circumstances, we would engage in the confidence of resurrection power. That we would look at our pain, our struggles, our doubts, our anxieties, and our fears, the things that we wish were different, under the hope and trust of your resurrection power. You have done all these things that we may experience life with you and life to the fullest. You are making something new. Lord, may we cling to that place our hope on that, but live in a manner that displays that we believe it to be true. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the victory, the salvation from sin, for paying our debt, for atoning for us what we could not do. We praise you. We love you. We live for you. We do all these things in your name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus died and died for me I see his wounds his 
week today, you're going to go, I'm assuming, for a lot of us, have some like nice family time, some nice family meals, celebrate, enjoy seeing grandkids, nieces, nephews, friends, parents, wherever it is you're seeing. It may not be the case, but whatever you're going to do, however you choose to remember the fact that your Savior, out of love for you, died, endured death, crucifixion, burial, and was raised again to give you victory, to, break, to pay for your salvation, however you choose to remember that. Today is one thing, but tomorrow, when the job, when it's not Resurrection Sunday, when that bill, when that doctor appointment, when that thing at school, when that errand, when that busted thing in your house, when that disappointment, when whatever comes at you, because life does not stop. I encourage you, at that time, Go to the Lord in prayer. Go back to the word. Remember the angel's words. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And if he is risen, if he is not in the tomb, if he overcame death, then whatever just brought you to your knees in prayer and to the word, he can manage that. Whatever took you to remember that and forced you to think back on that, he can help you navigate that. Whatever question you have, whatever struggle, whatever pain, he's big enough, loving enough, gracious enough, merciful enough, wise enough to see you through it, to bless you, to strengthen, to free you, to save you, to redeem you of it and of in it. We celebrate today, or we celebrate every day, because the truth of his resurrection is true every day. I encourage all of us to remember that as we leave here today into whatever God is calling us to do. And for today, we will close as we do every week by remembering the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we celebrate his resurrection by echoing his words and praying together as he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday. We love you guys and we'll see you next week. Have a good day today.